I'm a computer scientist. Um, I have been a politician. I remain a concerned citizen. Uh, but by profession, I'm a structural engineer. I'm a civil engineer. My father was an engineer. What he taught me about this profession was wherever you go, something that is interesting for engineers is right on the surface. Also here in Norrköping with your industrial complex. Um, one of the places I like going a lot is Istanbul. I'm a visiting professor there. And the interesting thing about this city is it has been top of the world. It has been the most powerful, the richest city in this part of the world twice in history. In the era of uh, Justinian as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and later when the Ottomans took over. And when empires try to show their strength, what they do is they build huge structures. It used to be churches in the past. Nowadays, there are World Trade Centers, banks, big hotels, etc. But civilizations prove themselves, they prove their quality by what they can build. And they have built, in Justinian times, in Constantinople, uh, Hagia Sophia. Those of you who have some experience with the handiwork, know that what is difficult to do is to cover large spaces, to make large volumes of covered space. This is what's difficult. It's not difficult to pile a lot of rock into a pyramid. And what they managed to do in year 500 was a dome with a diameter of 31 meters. I was there about um, three weeks ago, and it still strikes you as huge. Look at the scaffolding. This is modern steel scaffolding with stairs, etc. It's a huge space. And this was the largest building, the largest structure in the world for 1,000 years. The Ottomans took over in the, about um, in the end of 14th century. They also said, oh, we'll build something magnificent as well. They did this uh, Suleimania Mosque. It's a little bit more elegant, you would say, not so bulky. And they managed to do 26 meters in diameter. When you go in, it's much smaller. The difficulty goes with the square of the diameter, not, with the, not linearly. And then, a hundred years later, in Rome, a series of architects builds St. Peter's which is 10 meters bigger in diameter than Hagia Sophia. Finally, the world record is broken. And you wonder why. What happened? Nothing for 1,000 years, and then in 100 years, basically the tripling of the side between Suleimani and St. Peter's. What happened there? Um, was it the end of the Middle Ages? Some historians make, made a line. Was it the discovery of America? We learned how to build big structures from the American uh, Indians. Not really. The communication revolution number one happened around that time. Before that, communication technology was limited to parchment. If you want to communicate something, you would write it down on parchment. It was extremely expensive. You would have to kill a small animal to create a sheet or two. And they used it for very sacred things, like the Bible, a couple of Greek, Greek classics, and that was it. And the monks were copying these books, like uh, in the Name of the Rose movie, which uh, you might remember. And then some kind of globalization happened. A little bit of peace in Central Asia allowed European travelers to go to China safely and come back with a lot of ideas what was invented there. Like gunpowder, like spaghetti, like ice cream. All this was first invented in China, not in uh, Italy, not in Europe. But what they also brought, but Marco Polo also brought back with him, was technology how to make cheap and inexpensive paper out of wood, out of cellulose. And this paper became available for anything, not for Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and the Bible, but for Leonardo to do his drawings. It was also available to do engineering drawings. And I think it's a little coincidence that the actual first modern technical drawing, drawn to scale, drawn as a perfect top view, was for the design of the St. Peter's in Rome um, 
done by Bramante originally. The first modern design on this paper. What followed is uh, what we call history, or the nice part of European history. The Renaissance follows. The West advances faster than the rest to reach basically near full monopoly in science, in economy, in military, in politics in the early 20th century. Before the, before the First World War, Western economies combined were about 90 to 95 percent of the global output. This has been declining ever since, but still on this map, which is distorted by global economic output, and the data is for the 1960s, you see that basically the economic output of Europe is the same as the economic output of, the, of Asia, China, India, Japan, Africa combined. And of course, you would question, or we could attribute that to the fact that we really embraced communication technology much better than a few other civilizations. Paper did change everything, but it did not change everything everywhere. Paper is the basis for communication technologies. Paper is the basis for engineering drawing. Paper is the basis for print, for press, for media, for newspapers, for, post, um, for postal service, for, uh, for typewriters, and things like that. It's communication media, and it's the communication that glues elements of society together, extroverts and introverts. Um, but it's by communication that you make a family, it's by communication that you make a, a small company or a business, it's communication that glues a big business together, it's communication that brings the citizens of a city together, and it's by communication that you create a nation or a state, or if you want, humanity as a whole. Paper changed everything somewhere, but it did not change everything everywhere. Innovation traveled from China, it went through India, it went through the Arab Peninsula, it went through the Ottoman Empire, without making much of a difference. And when it landed in Europe, it made a huge difference. So why did it make a difference in Europe and not um, elsewhere? I think this is interesting. One of the answers is provided by uh, Jared Diamond, the answers to why Europe was so successful in the last, uh, in, in, in history so far. And he says, well, basically because of the guns, germs, um, and steel. And he explains very well why big civilization emerged in Mediterranean to begin with two or three thousand years ago. The answer number two by Niall Ferguson, he says the West had six killer apps, killer applications like competition, scientific revolution, rule of law and representative government, modern medicine, consumer society, and the work ethic. But in essence, if you look at these six, and if you look at the, the guns, germs, and steel, basically what I think things boil down to is that the West embraced, embraced communication revolution. It allowed for faster general availability because it was a more free society than those other ones, and it allowed for faster institutionalization of these technologies because th these societies were more flexible in comparison to the other civilizations en route from China to Europe. So this is 500 years ago, then communication revolution number two kicked in. We are all part of it. It started with innovation, electronic communication, Nikola Tesla, Marconi, Edison, and, and all the others. Communication without paper. It was firstly available like parchment for very special purposes, like transmitting picture from the moon or transmitting one favorite uh, soccer game in a country, etc. Some of these purposes were not so special. This is a second reference to Seinfeld today. But still, this communication means, like transmitting live pictures or live sound, was not cheaply available for everyone, for anything. It was exclusive until the dig digitalization of information happened, the internet, when you could actually use video communication, sound, voice, text, whatever, in, in any 
in, in any kind of uh, setting. 30 years ago, you would have in a country maybe two, three, four video streams that you could select your content from. Now you can select from millions of video streams. So there's the same pattern in the paper and the internet communication revolution. When it is available to few, it has a limited impact. But when it is available to many, it has a revolutionary impact. In fact, there's a theory of how innovation trickles down into society, which goes from innovation to habitualization to objectification and finally to sedimentation. First, you innovate, you get something new, you get something great, like the internet we all like so much, and mobile communication. Then these things become a habit. It's a habit among this audience to Google for information, to go to Wikipedia, to watch TED lectures, to share your own content, gather together on Facebook, Twitter, Skype, etc. And you may even use more advanced information technology for private purposes, not, for, not in your work. But still, businesses have to adapt. Because businesses, if they do not adapt new technology, they are on the market, somebody would adapt, they would go out of business. And finally, what should happen is sedimentation. The new technologies should evolve, should trickle down into the laws and rules and constitutions that we use in our society to organize us. And the speed of this change is not the same. Individuals can be very fast in adopting new technologies. Businesses um, are forced by the market. But then you have off-market organizations which are the slowest. And a change of policy and regulation is needed. So we can expect, and what we are witnessing, that the slower disruption, the slowest disruption is in the media, but also in the education, in the judiciary, and in the way we practice democracy. Example, why regulated system change slowly? You could not have a democracy in the Middle Ages without the media, without newspapers, without the possibility to, to distribute written uh, documents. Power had to be concentrated where you could communicate orally. But after paper revolutions came, democracy was introduced. Electronic communication empowered, empowered a few in the center that had the access to traditional electronic communication, like the television, like the media, etc. The few were empowered. And now, of course, in the age of the Internet, the masses get empowered. And something is bound to happen, and uh, Stefan was... was uh, telling us how to predict, basically on the micro scale, how we can go about it. And indeed, if history is any uh, teacher, we can expect that the way our society is organized will have to change because of the way we communicate or because of the way we can communicate to each other. But societies tend not to, um, and, and organizations of society tend not to change peacefully. This is what we can also learn. So what are the lessons? The lesson one is that an important element and an important view on history is that the history is also a history of communication. Humans are both individual as well as social beings. What we can accomplish together is also determined by, by, but how, by how well we can communicate. And history of human society is also history of communication technologies that was bringing this society together. History is not just one damned political, military, or dynastic thing after the other, or as Churchill would say it. It is not economic transition from agricultural to industrial to information economy. It's not a history of class struggle. It is also a history of that thing that brings society together. Lesson number two, revolutions disrupt. Communication revolution happens not when something is invented, but when something is democratically available to each and everyone. This happened 
after paper communication revolution, this is happening after or during the digital communication revolution. It is followed by revolutionary or historic disruptions in every element of society, including science, technology, education, economy, and politics, and including shifting of the global geopolitical power, but not everywhere. Culture and values are essential to select where the change will happen, where the change will be uh, beneficial and employ, er, and where it would not be. The fact is that at the end of the Middle Ages, Europe had the most convenient, the most friendly value system for this new communication uh, technologies. To embrace paper communication revolution, to allow it to empower people, to, uh, to empower businesses, to empower sciences, and of course to use it as a tool for equality in society. And it was in the United States that were set, setting up the country freshly, without much uh, of a historic luggage, that they could take note of that in the political system as well, and create democracy in a fairly, um, you could say, peaceful way. And the final message, we should open the opportunities for these newly empowered citizens, by all this, empowered by all this communication technology. Never before has so much education, information, knowledge, also contacts to other smart people been available to so many and so inexpensively and also so equally. Some people are worried that their differences in, um, in, in material wealth rising, but both rich and poor have access to TED lectures, both rich and poor have access to Wikipedia and to uh, Google and to uh, everything else. People will take advantage quickly, businesses will adapt, but what about governments and all these systems which are enshrined in laws? And the message to those who um, have an influence on that, institutions should be open for knowledge and talent, of the on, and talent on the outside, because most of the knowledge and talent about what you do is not within your organization, it's on the outside. And the other, the final message is, systems should be flexible to change. How we organized our societies in the paper communication model is not necessarily optimal as to how we organized for the digital age. Thank you.